Okay, and what's the problem? Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. Everybody's laying down We're in a pool of blood. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot, and the owner. On the morning of November 6, 2003, the people of Chesney, South Carolina, were stunned by a quadruple murder that took place in broad daylight. A shooting in the Superbike Motorsports shop that killed four people would leave investigators, paramedics, and the people of the society agitated and restless for finding the suspect. The owner of the Superbike Motorsports, 30-year-old Scott Ponder, his mother, Beverly Guy, 52, the shop mechanic, Chris Sherbert, 26, and Ponder's close friend and service manager, the 29-year-old Brian Lucas, were shot while they were working at the shop. What was the reason behind this quadruple murder? Who was responsible for this atrocious crime, and why? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today, we dive into the twisted and disturbing case of Scott Ponder. Chesney is a small town situated in Spartanburg and Cherokee counties in the state of South Carolina. A small city with only 851 population as of the 2021 census, the city enjoys rather stable weather with warm summers and cool winters. The city's filled with lumber mills and cotton mills, while also being home to many historic places. With a crime rate of 47 per thousand residents, Chesney has its fair share when it came to notorious crimes, but the residents weren't considered to be violent. That's why, when the quadruple murder took place on November 6, 2003, the people of Chesney were left in a daze. Scott Dean Ponder was born on February 7, 1973, and was raised by his loving family, consisting of his mother Beverly Guy and his stepfather Terry Guy. From an early age, Scott showed interest in cars and motorbikes that was greatly supported by his parents, who wanted him to improve his riding skills. They even got him a racer's license when he turned legal. Young Scott started taking racing as a lifestyle, even participating at the Daytona Motor Speedway in Florida. His sharp skills and excellent racing earned him numerous admirers and turned him into a local hero in the town of Chesney. Scott was also very social and preferred to hang out with large groups. People also loved Scott's company. Scott started the idea of the Superbike Motorsports first at his grandmother's backyard in the late 1990s where he would repair bikes. Slowly, he started to upgrade his shop to a one-garage building in 2001. He even decided to take in his best friend, Brian Lucas, as his co-partner in the business, and the two young men started to expand their business further. They signed up with Suzuki for a dealership, and their business grew unexpectedly in a short period of time. Brian, who used to work part-time at the starting of the business, decided to leave his job to become a full-time manager of the store. With their hard work and knowledge, the pair started attracting a lot of customers and the business started to bloom. Even though they were salesmen, they took utmost care when it came to their customers' knowledge about bikes or racing in general. Scott's mother, who first visited the store occasionally, now started to pay regular visits. Soon, she took up the job of taking care of the accounting, payroll, cash drops, and other such work. With the trio, the business boomed, selling 100,000 motorbikes every month. Scott decided to attend an industry convention in Chicago. It was during this trip that Scott met his wife, Melissa Brackman, a former homecoming queen from Stafford High School. They immediately clicked and started to enjoy each other's company, thus meeting up with each other often. As their relationship grew stronger, they decided to get married. Their love life, both before and after their marriage, mirrored that of a fairy tale where the love grew stronger every passing day. I met him at a motorcycle show in Indianapolis. He did strike me as a sweet, sweet southern gentleman type. It was almost like one day I woke up and said, oh no, I think I'm in love with this guy. To complete their family, Scott and Melissa decided to have a baby, but unfortunately for them, none of their attempts were bearing any fruit. Frustrated, the couple sought medical attention and advice, and finally, after months of struggles, Melissa was pregnant with a little baby boy in October of 2003. We were actually in my hometown at my brother's home, and I didn't tell anybody. I had run into the drugstore, grabbed a pregnancy test, and took a pregnancy test and started screaming in the bathroom because I was so excited about it. He got a big smile on his face. I love that he knew this baby was coming. With millions of sales in the very first year of business, Scott knew he had to expand his store even more. In order to do this, 
he required more hands on deck and decided to hire a new mechanic, Chris Sherbert. Chris was quite well known around town for his skilled use of the wrench that attracted Scott towards him. The four of them, Scott, Beverly, Brian, and Chris, became a sort of a dream team, and their business started to gain attention even outside the small town of Chesney. Everything was going perfectly for the young and talented Scott Ponder until the arrival of his doomsday. Living such a perfect life, Scott never imagined his happiness to be cut short, but this was what happened on November 6, 2003. It was a normal day, with not a cloud in the sky, and the sun was beaming, but it was not the case at the Superbike Motorsports. Obviously, you're, you have vivid memories of that particular day. Do you remember where you were? I do. That day, I had talked to him at, I don't know, maybe 2.15, somewhere around there. He called me, and it was a normal, you know, well, I'll see you later. I, I love you, bye. That was the last time I, I talked to him. Scott and the others started their day at the shop like any other. There were a few customers browsing items in the store. One of them was Kelly Sisk, who had his four-year-old son with him. He was going to buy a go-kart for his family, and after paying for it, he hung around in the shop for a little while longer. Brian actually had the day off because he was planning to go on a holiday with his family, but he was called in by Scott because there was a customer who said that the bike was not tended to as they promised. Brian came to the shop and immediately started to work on the customer's bike. Scott was tending to another customer when Beverly came by after taking Scott's cancer-stricken grandmother to chemo. She used to take deposits for her son to the bank, and that day she was intending to do the same. When she dropped by, she started to help Scott a little at the counter since she was planning to go to the bank much later. At around 2.30 p.m., Scott's friend Noel Lee called the shop. Beverly answered the phone, and he asked if he could stop by the shop, and it would only take him seven minutes for him to reach the shop, to which Beverly agreed. The conversation was short, and after putting the phone back down, Beverly decided to use the bathroom. In the span of seven minutes, all four people in the shop, Scott, Brian, Beverly, and Chris, were savagely shot to death in the Superbike Motorsports premises. At 3 p.m., when Scott's friend Noel came by, he saw Scott and Brian lying at the front of the shop as still as statues. At first, he thought they were playing a trick on him. He even lightly kicked both of them, telling them to stop messing with them until he saw the pool of blood underneath their bodies and immediately dialed 911. Okay, what's the problem? Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. Everybody's laying down We're in a pool of blood. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot, and the owner. Police and paramedics immediately rushed to the scene. After all, it was the first ever quadruple murder in such a small town like Chesney. The news of the homicide spread like wildfire, and not only the victim's family, but a dozen other people gathered at the crime scene in order to catch a glimpse. The police wasted no time and immediately started their investigation. They found the mechanic, Chris's body, at the back of the shop. It was bent over as if he was working on a bike right before he was robbed of his life. Next, they found Beverly's body inside the shop, right in front of the bathroom. The police believed she was ambushed right when she came out of the bathroom. The police found Brian and Scott's bodies, both lying at the front of the store. Brian's body was closer to the door, near the sidewalk, while Scott's body was closer to one of the parked cars in the parking lot. This, the police inferred, was maybe because both Scott and Brian were trying to run for their lives. They went inside, probably on hearing the gunshots, and came face to face with the shooter. And on seeing the dead bodies of Chris and Beverly, they immediately ran out the door, but their attempt to escape failed miserably. The police and forensic team searched the crime scene thoroughly and gathered blood samples and other evidence from the crime scene. This was an execution-style homicide, where the shooter entered the shop with the motive to murder the people present there and shot them in the chest and head, point-blank. Scott's wife, Melissa, got a call about the shooting and immediately rushed to the scene. Detectives conducted a thorough investigation, and it didn't take them long to arrive at their first clue. From the statements made by a few passerbys in the area at the time of the murder, they declared to have spotted a couple loitering near the shop, Sketches of the suspects were drawn during the questioning of these eyewitnesses, and the detectives immediately circulated the pictures all over South Carolina. The detectives speculated that the man was the one who shot the victims, Chris and Beverly, at the back, while the woman was distracting the two men, Scott and Brian, up front. When the man came to the front where the two men were, he shot them. 
This was just mere speculation by the detectives, and none of the facts in this theory were proven. Months passed, and police couldn't find any clue regarding the case. Extensive media coverage of the case started putting pressure into the detectives as they started to revisit the crime from a different perspective, and sure enough, a breakthrough appeared. Detectives started to do a thorough study of the victim's past and current lifestyles, and though Scott, Beverly, and Brian's backgrounds came out to be clean, it was not the same for the mechanic, Chris Sherbert. When detectives checked Chris's previous job, the news of a drug connection came into the picture. The detectives found out that Chris might have been involved with the wrong company and was also responsible for smuggling drugs. Moreover, Chris was scheduled to go to court the following Monday before the murder took place. It was 2003 when drug smuggling and abuse was increasing every single day and the police were hoping to arrest the key criminal players to eradicate the root cause of drug abuse, especially among young teens. The detectives and the public now started to wonder if this quadruple homicide took place with the motive to murder only Chris and the other three victims were just collateral damage. They even started to speculate that maybe the people involved in this drug business thought that Chris would give evidence against them in court on Monday and decided to end his life. The detectives said that this could be a possibility since Chris was the one who was shot first. However, regarding this path of speculation, no evidence was found by the police. Therefore, the investigation stalled again. Finally, after a whole year, the detectives approached the case from a completely different angle once again. The detectives found that Brian, Scott's friend and co-worker, was looking for a house weeks before the murder, but strangely enough, his wife Robin had no idea regarding this decision taken by him. Later, Brian's mother, Lorraine Lucas, spoke of the unhappy and strained marriage between the pair and how Brian was planning to move out to live alone. I was trying to have a conversation with him and his wife was sitting behind him and making faces. Long story short, Brian ended up saying to her, this is my mother, I want you to treat her with respect. And it started to become a confrontation. Though this didn't seem to have a connection to the shooting, a discovery made by the detectives a few days later brought out a shocking revelation to the case. This quadruple homicide took the lives of four people and broke the hearts of many others. The victims' families were coping with the hard times, but it was especially hard for Melissa. Her life was perfect before it all came crashing down when her beloved husband was shot. Despite all this, Melissa knew she couldn't give up now that she had a new reason to continue living, and that was her son. When Melissa's son, Scott Ponder Jr., was born in June 2004, Melissa was still being called upon by the police at intervals for interrogation. In one such incident, the police collected the DNA sample of Scott Jr. from a discharged diaper when Melissa had changed him at the station itself. The results of the DNA test left everyone dumbfounded. According to the reports, Scott Jr. was not the child of Scott, but Brian, since his DNA matched with Brian's found at the crime scene. This created tension between Melissa and her father-in-law, William Ponder, who kept asking her if this was true. They actually told her they had proof. Me and Melissa sat down and talked, and I told her, I said, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. Did you have anything to do with it? If proof comes out that you did, wherever you at, I'll come and get you and bring you back myself. The detectives started to approach this case from the point of a possible love triangle between Scott, Melissa, and Brian. Questions about her being unfaithful to her husband spread all throughout the neighborhood. Moreover, Brian's mother stated that it was possible for Brian to have an affair, considering how unhappy Brian was in his marriage, and the thought of divorce might have crossed his head at times. Melissa was called multiple times to the police station for interrogation about her affair, but she was resolute. She said that both she and Scott had struggled a lot to conceive this baby, and Scott Jr. was undoubtedly Scott Ponder's child. She later told about how she was harassed every day by the same questions when she knew it was hers and Scott's baby. For the next year and a half, detectives kept track of every move made by Melissa in order to find a breakthrough. Finally, after 18 months, however, the detectives claimed that there must have been a mistake regarding the blood sample collected at the crime scene. The detectives stated that they'd conducted a DNA test for Beverly and Scott from the blood sample collected from the crime scene, and the results did not match. In the reports, Brian's DNA matched Beverly's when, clearly, Scott was the son of Beverly. At this point, the detectives knew that they'd made a grave mistake. 
They put the wrong name in the blood sample of Scott and Brian collected from the crime scene since both the bodies of Scott and Brian were lying next to each other. This cleared up all the accusations laid against Melissa. Disregarding the love triangle theory, detectives now started to link the case with another homicide, just 30 miles away, that had happened just five months before the Superbike Motorsports homicide. On May 16, 2003, the people of Greer, South Carolina, heard the news of a triple homicide that took place in the Blue Ridge Savings Bank. Sylvia Holtzclaw was on duty that day, though she had a day off. Soon, a local couple, Eb and Maggie Barnes, visited the bank. At around 1.30 p.m., a 911 call went through to the Greer Police Department regarding a shooting that had taken place in the Blue Ridge Savings Bank, where Sylvia, Eb, and Maggie were shot to death. On May 16th at 1.30 in the afternoon, a call came into the Greer Police Department. It was an alarm call from the Blue Ridge Savings Bank. I was one of uh, probably the second or third or maybe fourth to get there. Just like in the Superbike Motorsports, the shooting happened in broad daylight with no witnesses available. When police checked the CCTV footage, they saw a red car that was driving to the bank at around 1.24 p.m., and it was seen again when it was driving back from the bank three minutes after the incident. There was a red car that was seen uh, driving to the bank on the Furnage Road at about 1.24 p.m. The Barnes family was seen driving three minutes later. Coincidentally, a similar red car was spotted during the quadruple homicide at the Superbike Motorsports. Detectives started to hunt down the red car and found a clue that it was stolen by 39-year-old Emerson Wright from a rental lot days before the homicide. The police concluded that he'd entered the bank to rob, but panicked and shot the couple when they tried to intervene. Unfortunately, the detectives never got to question Emerson regarding the bank and the Superbike Motorsports murder because of how incidents unfurled two years later in another car chase involving him and the Georgia State Police. He was wanted for a series of burglaries in the Atlanta area. When he was chased by the state trooper, he crashed his car, got out, and shot himself with a single gunshot wound to his head. Later, the detectives declared that though there are similarities between the two cases, they didn't believe that the two cases were connected. Left with no clues or possible theories to continue their investigation, the quadruple homicide at the Superbike Motorsports turned into a cold case months later in 2004. For 13 years, Melissa, along with the other families of the victims, didn't stop with their efforts of finding any clue that might lead them to the person who was responsible for this atrocious crime, but to no avail. Finally, a ray of hope shone on them when the cold case of the quadruple murder that took place on November 6, 2003 in Superbike Motorsports reopened when the detectives got a breakthrough in the case in 2016, 13 years after the crime had been committed. The man behind the shooting came into the spotlight when he was arrested for a different murder that he'd committed, and during the interrogation, he confessed to the Superbike Motorsports quadruple murder. This man was 45-year-old Todd Kolhep. Todd was born on March 7, 1971, to mother Reggie Tagg and father William Samsel. His parents divorced when he was two years old, and though he started to live with his mother and her new boyfriend, he wanted to spend more time with his biological father. Todd was extremely aggressive and hyper, at times not having self-resistance over his anger issues. He was a troublesome kid and showed hostility towards animals when he was in nursery school. He killed a goldfish with Clorox bleach and shot a dog with a BB gun. He spent three and a half months in Georgia Psychiatric Hospital, but there seemed to be no change in his aggressive behavior. His mother, Reggie, finally decided to send him to his father, William, hoping a change in the environment would help his behavior. On November 25, 1986, now 15-year-old Todd planned the kidnapping of a 14-year-old girl named Christy Granado in Tempe, Arizona. He knocked on her door, threatened her with a 22 caliber revolver, and demanded for her to follow him to his house. He brought her to his home, tied her up, taped her mouth shut, and then proceeded to assault her. Afterwards, he walked her home and threatened to kill her entire family if she told anyone about what had happened. Christy, however, confessed everything to her parents, and her father called 911 immediately. Kolhep was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and committing a dangerous crime against children. In 1987, he pleaded guilty to the kidnapping charge and the other charges were dropped. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and registered as a sex offender. When he was released, Todd was a changed man. 
he started to work for himself and even got a job. No further complaints were heard against him until 2016. On August 31, 2016, 30-year-old Calla Brown and her boyfriend, the 32-year-old Charlie David Carver, went missing after they were last seen going to Todd's house to remove brush from one of Todd's properties. On November 3, 2016, investigators found Calla chained to a wall inside a metal storage container on the property of Todd. Later, investigators also retrieved the body of Charlie that had multiple gunshot wounds in it. Calla told the detectives that Todd shot Charlie and kept her chained up. He would always assault her in a barbaric manner and threatened her not to find ways to escape. Todd was immediately arrested by the police and taken in for questioning. During this arrest, Todd confessed to being the person behind the shooting that took place at the Superbike Motorsports 13 years earlier. When Todd was called in for the interrogation on November 5, 2016, he started to tell the detectives everything that happened on November 6, 2003. He didn't confess out of fear or guilt, but merely as if recalling a memory. He said that he bought a Suzuki GSXR 750 from Superbike Motorsports, but just days after buying the bike, he realized he couldn't ride it. Having no prior knowledge of riding a bike, Todd then decided to exchange the bike for another one that would be much easier to ride for a beginner such as Todd. He then told the detective that he was mocked by Scott and Brian for his inability to ride such a bike. The bike exchange didn't take place that day and Todd returned home. Fourteen days after the purchase, the bike got stolen from the front of the apartment complex where Todd lived. He filed a police complaint regarding the stolen bike, but the police never found the vehicle. Todd also mentioned that even the law enforcement officer made fun of him. He lost a $1,000 deposit for insurance, but neither the police nor the shop contacted him after that regarding the stolen bike. Todd started college and went to Greenville Tech. His attraction towards bikes never faded, and soon he found himself going back to the Superbike Motorsports once again. He told the police that when he was browsing through the bikes in the shop, both Scott and Brian were giving negative remarks about him. Since then, whenever Todd visited the shop, the two men would mock and laugh at him. One day, he decided to take a Beretta 92 FS with him when he went to the shop. He waited for the customers to leave, and the shop was left with only Scott, Brian, Chris, and Beverly. Todd savagely shot all the victims to death. Though later he added that Beverly was not a target. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hearing the confession made by Todd gave the victims' families the long-drawn justice and the closure that they were seeking for the past 13 years. Later, Todd also confessed to have killed three more people who were Johnny Joe and Megan Lee Coxey and Charlie David Carver. These three victims also died due to gunshots fired by Todd Colheap. In the case of Todd Colheap, even though it was a serial killer case, there was no trial that took place. Instead, prosecutors spoke to the families of those he'd murdered as well as to the survivor and decided to give him a plea deal instead of taking him to trial where the state offered Todd life without the possibility of parole, which he accepted only seven months after his arrest. Todd was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences on May 23, 2017. In addition, he was sentenced to 30 years for sexual assault and 30 years for kidnapping. Not having a trial did not give the satisfaction to the victim's families regarding the justice that was needed to be served. It also angered the general public. It's not fair for families to wait years and years for justice, Seventh Circuit solicitor Barry Barnett later told reporters. But Scott Ponder's wife Melissa said that she was finally relieved to get closure regarding her husband's death after all these years. All the family members and relatives of the victims came together to hold a candlelight vigil in remembrance of their beloved ones whom they'd lost to the hands of a serial killer. After 13 drawn-out years of pain and suffering, the victims' families were grateful to finally learn what exactly happened to their loved ones. In one interview, Scott's wife Melissa did state that the reason Todd gave for murdering Scott and the others didn't sit right with her, since she knew Scott well enough to know that he'd never make fun of someone and make them feel little in front of him. I can see Scott and I can see Brian laughing and joking, but not one time could I ever picture them belittling someone or making them feel less than, than what they were. And that right there tells me that he, Todd, couldn't have been in his right mind. Nevertheless, she was grateful that justice had finally been served. 
The public was left disturbed by the lack of empathy and the casual behavior that Todd showed while being interrogated by the police or during his court appearances. They wanted Todd to receive the death penalty since he was a monster to society. Today's case was truly a twisted and disturbing one. Todd was truly a demon. To kill several people and not have an ounce of guilt is quite shocking. Moreover, talking about the murders during interrogation as if revisiting a past memory was despicable. Before we leave you, do you think the confession given by Todd was true? Could Scott and Brian indeed have made fun of him that made him take up this step? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hitting that like button, and sharing our videos. Also, if you have any crime story that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comment section below. Until next time, stay safe.